Every April, a group of scientists observes the faint glow of asteroids passing by our planet. One year, they realized there was something weird shimmering in their telescopes. The team expected it to be another asteroid. But they ended up very surprised, because what they discovered was an unusual space rock that didn't consist of the minerals that usually make up asteroids. It was made of silicate, the material mostly found on the moon. They named it Kamo Oaliwa, which is a Hawaiian word that means wobbling celestial object. The rock didn't match any near-Earth asteroid scientists had already been familiar with. Instead, that piece had a pattern of reflected light similar to that of the moon rocks astronauts had brought back from NASA missions. This fragment turned out to be a quasi-satellite, which is a kind of asteroids that orbit both our planet and the Sun. It repeatedly circles Earth and has a quite unusual tilt. That's the reason you can only see it in the night sky once a year. The fragment is pretty shy, too. Aw, it never gets closer to our planet than 9 million miles. That's almost 40 times as far away as the moon. Plus, this space body often hides in the shadows. Scientists have figured out the piece won't stay in this orbit for a long time. It probably arrived at its current position about 500 years ago. And its orbit is likely to change in the next 300 years. This fragment may not be alone out there in space. Mm -mm. There are at least three more similar near-Earth objects. They may have all come from the same place. Researchers aren't sure yet about the nature of the rock, but they can find out more about this unusual space object if they send a spacecraft to collect samples and bring them to Earth. That's something China's space agency is planning to do later this decade. Now, the moon appeared in the middle of chaos. There are several theories about how that happened. The first one claims the moon used to be just a wandering body, similar to an asteroid. It formed somewhere in our solar system. Once, it approached too close to Earth and got captured by our planet's gravity. The second theory says that our planet was spinning so quickly that some material broke off and started circling around it. One of the largest pieces was the moon. The third theory says that the Moon was formed at a time when our planet was going through its own formation process. But today, the most widely accepted theory goes like this. Once, a long, long time ago, but not in a galaxy far, far away. Earth collided with a Mars-sized planet. The debris and clouds of dust from the collision gathered around our planet and started circling it. Eventually, something that we today know as the Moon formed there. Apollo missions brought more than a third of a ton of soil and rock from the lunar surface. These rocks show that the Moon had mostly the same building materials as our planet. This might mean they have a common history. If the Moon had been formed somewhere else and had been eventually captured by the gravitational force of our planet, it would have a different composition. Also, if it had been created at the same time as our planet or had once broken off, there would be the same minerals on both the Moon and Earth. But the minerals on the Moon contain less water. Plus, our planet's natural satellite is rich in materials that form fast at high temperatures. Now, the Moon isn't the only space body in the solar system with a mysterious past. Hippocamp is Neptune's moon, discovered in 2013. It's the smallest moon of this ice giant, a mere 21 miles across. It's very close to Proteus, the biggest of Neptune's inner moons. And no, Hippocamp is not a place for big African mammals to spend the summer. Scientists think Hippocamp probably formed from debris after Proteus collided with a comet. If Hippocamp had entered Proteus's orbit from some other place in our solar system, the bigger moon would have either swallowed it or booted the tiny moon away. But not even Proteus itself is among the first generation of Neptune's moons. It was formed from the remains of the planet's earliest system of moons. Those first moons were destroyed when Neptune captured Triton, currently the largest of its moons. The main evidence proving the collision was likely to happen is the fact that Triton circles around Neptune backward, unlike other moons orbiting the planet. Neptune captured Triton from the Kuiper Belt. That's an area filled with icy objects and rocky debris stretching beyond Uranus. That means Hippocamp is a third-generation moon, kind of like a second cousin twice removed or something. Now the Sun also had a turbulent past. Our star appeared about 4.6 billion years ago. It's hard to study its early stages of life since that happened 50 million years before our planet was even formed. But recently, a team of researchers has discovered crystals that are over 4.5 billion years old. Hidden deep within meteorites, 
they've revealed some things about the past of our Sun. Before the planets were formed, our solar system had consisted of a central star and a massive disk of dust and hot gas spiraling around it. As the dust and gases cooled down, they turned into minerals, including the crystals found in the meteorites that landed on our planet. Those ancient materials were irradiated, unlike some younger substances. Researchers think something might have happened to the Sun after those crystals were formed. Perhaps the activity of our star was less intense then. Or maybe, for some reason, these younger materials couldn't travel to the areas where irradiation was possible. Dwarf planets give us a chance to sneak a peek into the ancient years of the solar system. Around 4 billion years ago, Jupiter's, Saturn's, and Neptune's gravitational forces joined. They sent asteroids and comets hurtling across the solar system, making them collide with different planets. All the dwarf planets from the Kuiper Belt, for example Pluto, Eris, Haumea, Makemake, have their own moons that likely formed after some powerful collisions. Icy debris in orbit similar to Haumea's, for example, can prove the theory of an ancient collision. The debris it created simply didn't have enough energy to float away from the dwarf planet's gravitational pull. Ceres, another dwarf planet, has ammonia-rich clays on its surface. Ammonia isn't stable at the temperatures prevailing on Ceres. But there's plenty of this substance in the outer solar system. It means that Ceres was probably formed in those outer parts and got kicked inward. After all, the gas giants were migrating a lot at those early stages of the solar system. Or the dwarf planet could have formed in an asteroid belt, and ammonia somehow, let's say after a powerful impact, appeared on the dwarf planet. Ceres might help scientists understand icy moons better. The ocean floor on Earth has a high concentration of carbonate minerals, and some parts of Ceres have them too. This means this dwarf planet is like some sort of fossilized ocean world. Many exoplanets, a term used for planets outside the solar system, have also gone through pretty intense collisions in their early stages. This double star system is more than 300 light years away from us, and its stars are at least 1 billion years old. Even though it's not young, this system still shows some signs of swirling clouds of dusty debris that haven't cooled down yet, which isn't something you'd expect from a star system of this age. This debris is still warm. It means there might have been a strong collision of two planets or some other space bodies of similar size in that region and relatively recently. So hey, everybody just simmer down. Dust particles circle around a young star. They stick together and grow bigger with time. That's how planets form. The leftover dust often settles in some distant cold areas. An example in our solar system is the Kuiper Belt. It's located far away beyond Neptune. As solar systems evolve, those particles keep colliding until they're so small they end up being pulled into nearby stars or kicked out of the system. Uranus spins on its side if you compare it with the rest of the planets in our solar system. And the only way we can explain it is a powerful collision in the past. Something much bigger than a regular comet or some other space body of similar size likely hit Uranus and knocked the planet on the side. It was probably a planet twice the size of Earth. It could be a protoplanet. This is a space body made up mostly of ice and rock that orbits a star and is likely to develop into a planet sometime in the future. Anyway, the fallout from the impact smothered the core of Uranus. It prevented the heat inside the planet from escaping. This might explain why Uranus has extremely cold temperatures on its surface. <laughs> Man, bring a jacket and a blanket. Neil Armstrong had been getting ready for his mission on the moon for over three years. To resist microgravity conditions, he had to learn how to walk sideways by being strapped and suspended at an angle in trying to walk along walls. His limits were tested through an intense diet and sleep regimen. Since in space, he would only have beef and vegetables, previously dehydrated and stuffed into a package. Back in the day, astronauts had to experience the desert, jungle, open sea, and Arctic survival training. These days, it's a lot more structured. But back then, it was more of a let's drop this person in the middle of nowhere with no supplies and see if they make it. Before landing on the moon, he had to gather and study rock samples in the Grand Canyon, explore ancient volcano formations in the Nevada National Security Site, and look into gas and lava vents, lava lakes, and pit craters in various locations in Hawaii. On July 20, 1969, 
Armstrong was given a hearty breakfast before blast-off. Steak, eggs, toast, juice, and coffee. He received what doctors call a low-residue meal, which means he wouldn't have to go to the bathroom soon after. It took him 109 hours and 42 minutes to reach the surface of the moon, in an area called the Sea of Tranquility. He had to travel 240,000 miles to get there. The crew could have gone for the Ocean of Storms or the Central Bay, but this place was chosen for landing because it had good visibility, was relatively smooth, and was easily reachable with as little propellant as possible. When he was at about 500 feet above the surface of the moon, Armstrong had to maneuver the spacecraft manually to make sure they wouldn't land in a dangerous crater. He continued to hover for about a minute and a half, moving it sideways until he felt comfortable to land. As soon as his device landed safely, he immediately radioed to Mission Control, located in Houston, Texas. The now famous message, The Eagle has landed. Steadily, he went down the Lunar's module's ladder. While a television camera was attached to the craft to record his progress, the camera also transmitted the signal back to Earth, where hundreds of millions of people were anxiously waiting. At precisely 10.56 p.m. EDT on the same day, Armstrong placed his feet onto the lunar soil, saying, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The schedule said that the astronaut needed to sleep before the first moonwalk, but he chose to go outside earlier than planned, since he obviously couldn't sleep. If Armstrong had walked on the moon without special equipment to breathe, he would have smelled a weird odor, sort of musty and sulfuric. Still, he had the chance to smell it when he returned to the lunar module. The thing is, the dirt had clung to his feet, so the odor spread all over the cabin. He described it as wet fireplace ashes, or how the air smells after fireworks shows. Who would have thought you needed to pack a scented candle when going to the moon? Apart from the people that have since made it to the moon, no one ever got the chance to know precisely what the crew was smelling. Even during that first mission, when moon soil and rock samples were transported to labs in airtight containers, once they were opened back on Earth, surprisingly, the smell was gone. He also felt the surface of the moon to be fine and powdery, but said he had no difficulty in moving around. One other member of his crew joined him about 20 minutes later. The whole moonwalk took a little over two hours. During this time, Armstrong and his teammates set up various devices on the surface of our satellite. One was meant to precisely measure the exact distance from there to Earth by timing how long it took for a laser beam to travel from Earth to the lunar surface and back. Another meant to measure moonquakes and potential meteor impacts, which leads us to the discovery that the moon was pretty alive after all. We know today that the largest moonquakes are much weaker than the largest earthquakes, though their movements can last for up to an hour, way longer than on Earth. They managed to gather somewhere around 50 pounds of rock in soil samples. They also snapped many photographs of the terrain, where they also planted a U.S. flag. The astronaut even got the chance to catch up with President Richard Nixon, for less than a minute though. The final thing on the list for Armstrong was to go for a walk to what is now known as East Crater, 65 yards east of the lunar module. It was the greatest distance traveled from the spacecraft on that specific mission, approximately the length of half a football field. As soon as his tasks were done, Armstrong went back into the lunar module and safely closed the hatch to get some sleep. While preparing for liftoff, Armstrong and his crew discovered that, because of their chunky spacesuits, they managed to break the ignition switch for the ascent engine. No big deal, they thought. So they used a part of a pen to push in the circuit breaker to start the launch sequence. At 1.54 p.m., the famous Eagle began to ascend. Apart from the scientific equipment installed on the surface of the moon, a plaque was also left there. It read, Here. Men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. Years later, 
Armstrong said that NASA limited their time on the moon because they didn't know how the spacesuits would handle the moon's extreme temperatures, as high as 260 degrees Fahrenheit during the day to as low as 280 degrees Fahrenheit below zero at night. Things got a bit more complicated when Armstrong landed back on Earth. Since he had been exposed to unknown space particles, the result? He and his team had to be placed in planetary protection quarantine on their return. As soon as their space capsule safely splashed down in the Pacific Ocean on July 24th. That specific quarantine for the Apollo 11 astronauts is one of the reasons why we have microwaves in our kitchens today. When they first returned from the moon, they initially spent their first few days in a mobile quarantine facility, or MQF. Sure, the MQF featured comfortable chairs, bunks, a toilet, and showers, but it didn't leave a lot of space for fancy cooking. Since there was no room for a standard oven or grill, and to also reduce the potential fires that might have occurred, NASA had to get creative. That's how the original countertop microwave oven was developed, to easily help astronauts get their meals without the hustle of a fully equipped kitchen. These days you can see that first microwave in a museum in Oakland, California. After returning to Earth, Armstrong claimed he would never reach for the stars again. But he didn't stop exploring, though. Back in 1985, he joined a professional team of other greatest explorers to the North Pole. He was joined by mountaineer Edmund Hillary, aviator Steve Fawcett, and photographer Patrick Morrow, reaching the pole on April 6, 1985. Armstrong claimed he wanted to see what the Earth's icy pole looked like from the ground since he had only seen it from the surface of the moon. The Apollo 11 mission was nevertheless unforgettable for Armstrong since. In 2015, the Smithsonian Institution uncovered that he had kept hidden a cloth bag full of small parts from the lunar module. It included his waist tether, some utility lights, and their brackets, an emergency wrench, in the optical site that was mounted above Armstrong's window of the space module. It also contained the data acquisition camera that recorded the iconic footage of Armstrong taking his small step on the moon. Armstrong kept it to himself for many years until his widow Carol eventually found it. He even kept it a secret from his official biographer who at many times asked if he had kept any memorabilia from his famous mission. He didn't sneak those objects back on Earth, though. He just mentioned it to be a bunch of trash he wanted to bring back. Now, what would Earth look like if it was the only planet in the solar system? Or, what would happen to our planet if the moon went missing? Or, what if dinosaurs had never gone extinct? We've all heard the story, over 66 million years ago, a big asteroid hit Earth. Almost 75% of creatures that roamed the planet at the time were wiped out in mass extinction. Among them, dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Velociraptor, all gone. But because of that, we're all alive. According to science, the human race was developing more safely without these gigantic creatures hunting us. But what if that asteroid had crashed to the ground a few miles away from the place where it fell? What would the world be like today? Imagine walking down the street to your local supermarket and coming across a truck-sized T-Rex. Could that ever happen in this alternate universe we're talking about? Well, dinosaurs would have had to survive a lot more than an asteroid to be living nowadays. About 55 million years ago, the temperatures on the planet rose. The climate became 14 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is today. Rainforests flourished, and vegetation was abundant. In this scenario, herbivore dinosaurs would have likely thrived. But they would have started to look a bit different. Plants started growing during that time period were not very rich in nutrients. This means that dinosaurs would have probably shrunk in size, not having the necessary energy to grow all the way to their full size. Then, about 34 million years ago, South America and Antarctica split, which resulted in a cooler and drier climate. During this period, long-legged dinosaurs would have been the ones to survive. At that time, animals had to travel long distances to hunt, since seasons started to affect the availability of food and water. 
compared to the mammals of that period, dinosaurs would have had significant advantages, like having more teeth or better eyesight. And speaking of mammals, some of them probably would have never evolved. That would have become dinosaurs' breakfast first. By the way, did you know that some dinosaurs live among us today? Think pigeons or birds in general. They've all evolved from dinosaurs. Now I bet you've heard once or twice that we use 10% of our brains. If this was true, what would happen if you used 100% of our brain? Would you be able to compose a symphony? Would you become a tech genius and create a multi-million dollar company overnight? Let's start with the facts. We don't only use 10% of our brain. This notion became highly popularized by movies, but it's not very accurate. The truth is, the largest portion of your brain is active at all times. But not all parts are working simultaneously. The exact percentage varies from person to person. Now, neurologists say you wouldn't be using 100% of your brain's capacity at once. Your body simply wouldn't have enough energy for that, which means you'd be hungry all the time. Imagine the number of calories you'd need to consume for that to work. You would also be limited by your body's basic needs, breathing, digesting food, and circulating blood. So if you did use all of the capacity of your brain, you'd be tired all the time. It'd be worse than running a marathon without any preparation. The brain would need all the blood you'd have, which would mean less oxygen for your lungs. Different organs would begin to shut down one by one. In a nutshell, it'd be terrible for your health. By the way, some researchers have estimated that more than 60% of the brain is composed of something that is called neural dark matter. In other words, this dark matter consists of neurons that have no apparent purpose or simply don't respond to common stimuli. Marathons are some of the greatest feats of strength and endurance in the world, but what would happen to your body if you decided to run a marathon without any training? The statistics are overwhelming. Nearly 50% of participants drop out of the race before crossing the finish line. A regular marathon is 26 miles long, and if you're not used to physical activity, it's a great challenge. You'd probably be able to run the first mile without any serious problems, but breathing loudly and heavily through your mouth. By the third mile, your body temperature would skyrocket, and you'd feel as if you have a mild fever. You'd most likely give up here, but if you decided to keep going, you'd have to trick your mind and body into running another 23 miles. By the 20th mile, you'd hit what is known as the wall. Your body would have burned all your reserves of glucose, and you'd get extremely tired. Even experienced runners often go through this stage. By the end of the marathon, you'd be promising yourself to never do this again. You'd leave the race with at least a few cramps and many food cravings. Now picture this, it's a clear, beautiful night. There are no clouds and you can see two of the brightest planets in Earth's sky blinking up there. Those are Mars and Venus. Now have you ever imagined what would happen if Earth was the only planet in the solar system? If the other planets never existed, things would be really different for our Earth. The planets in the solar system work together, keeping one another in certain place with their gravitational pull. Now if Mercury or Venus ceased to exist, Earth would drift closer to the Sun. Our atmospheric temperature would become similar to that on the surface of Mercury. 800 degrees Fahrenheit. This would make life on Earth impossible, but if Jupiter or Saturn disappeared, Earth would most likely drift further away from the Sun, and its temperature would drop to below negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If life managed to survive in such circumstances, it would probably be aquatic. The position of Earth in the solar system not only affects all kinds of life forms, but it also dictates seasons, the length of days, and how long one year lasts. Now when we say no other planets, we mean no moons either. So, what would happen if one fine day, the moon just disappeared? That would have catastrophic consequences. The moon has the largest influence on Earth's tides. In a moonless universe, tides would shrink by about 75%. This would greatly affect crabs, mussels, and sea snails that live in tidal zones. This would consequently disrupt the diet of larger animals. 
Eventually, it would affect entire coastal ecosystems. Earth's weather would change. Tides and tidal currents help mix cold Arctic water with warmer water from the tropics, stabilizing the climate worldwide. Weather forecasting would become almost impossible, and the average difference between the hottest and coldest places on Earth would become extreme. The absence of the moon would also influence Earth's tilt. Right now, Earth tilts on its axis at 23.5 degrees, mostly due to the moon's gravity. With no moon around, Earth's axis would wobble between 10 to 45 degrees. Scientists believe that even a slight difference in Earth tilt can cause huge changes, such as an ice age. Other than this, a moonless sky would upend the lives of many nocturnal animals. Moths have evolved to navigate using the light of the moon and stars. Newborn baby turtles use the moon's light to find their way to the ocean. Different animals rely on both darkness and a small amount of moonlight to hunt effectively. Now how about we travel far back in time and imagine what would happen if you lived in ancient Egypt. This civilization lasted for over 3,000 years. Ancient Egyptians were responsible for building some of the world's most recognizable symbols, the Great Pyramids at Giza. If you'd lived in ancient Egypt, you'd have witnessed a time of enormous scientific and mathematical breakthroughs. Ancient Egyptians organized themselves in strict social structures, so you'd probably have to fit into one of them. You'd have either been born a laborer, a farmer, or a specialist, which was either a soldier, a sailor, or a teacher, or you'd have been part of the Egyptian elite. If you had been a farmer, you'd probably live in a house made of mud bricks. You'd have had a stone oven and kept your food stored in a pit in the ground. You'd have spent your days tending to crop fields by the Nile River or taking care of cattle and ducks. On tax days, you'd have packed up some of your harvest and brought it to the temple as payment for the usage of land. If you'd been a member of the elite, you'd have spent most of your days in banquets. You would have adorned yourself in gold and semi-precious stones, displaying all your wealth. If you had lived in ancient Egypt, maybe you would have been one of those who invented tables. Yep, before the Egyptians, there was no such thing as a table. This invention appeared as a way to keep food off the ground.